Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, very good question, Shia Shia. Uh, how can we uh, make sure uh, we're not competing for the dunya yet taking chances uh, in our lives? Because I think there might be a fine line there. So basically, you're saying that how can we make sure that when we, as we are taking our chances, we don't get this basically dissolved into the matters of dunya? Yeah, matters of dunya, kind of competing, trying to have more money than the other person, better job, and so on. Kind of, I think there might be a fine line there between those two thoughts. There is indeed a fine line over there, actually. So we, as Muslims, we have we hold a very high uh, uh, rules of ethics, basically, meaning in terms of. Uh, not cheating, not lying, not stepping on other people's backs to get to your position and all the stuff and so on. So whenever we say that you take chances, that doesn't mean that you go and violate other people's rights. No, taking chances, that means you take, as we said, the right action, making the right decision, and taking some risk, inshallah, for that, for that, for that position, but without committing any haram. It's not worth it to get what you want to get regardless of the circumstances. No, we don't believe in this materialism activity, basically. You always make sure that what you do is haram and permissible for you to do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in, in the story of uh, 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 Qarun. Qarun is the, world, the very wealthy rich man of Bani Israel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, Allah al Means whatever Allah has given you of the boundaries of this dunya, seek the pleasure of the akhir with it. And then Allah said to him, Wala tansa min dunya, but don't forget about your share in this world. So we have to maintain balance between our plans for the Akhirah and plans for the dunya. Wallahu. A question here seems to come from my brother for sure. How do I ask a sister for marriage? <laughs> my answer is first ask your parents. If they accept that from you, it means you're ready, inshallah. If they don't accept that from you, don't even try. <laughs> because honestly, you're going to consume yourself in the love kind of thing, which is going to kill you without being able to achieve anything in reality. So my recommendation for the brothers, before you go and ask a sister for marriage, if you're really ready for it, meaning if your parents are approving it, you have the support of the family, and you have financial alhamdulillah stability and so on, then yeah, I agree with you. If you get to that point, then come to me and ask the question. But this seems to be a question that, you know, I just have a sister and I would like to take chances so I don't want to miss her and lose her to someone else. <laughs> How can I basically reserve this sister before it's too late? I would say take chances by preparing yourself so that when you go and you propose, they would say, welcome. And instead of saying, and who's your dad, Sonny? <laughs> so make sure that you're ready for it before you go and you propose. Now. Can a Muslim man marry a non-Muslim girl? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentioned that in Surah Al-Ma'idah وَالْمَحْصَنَاتُ الَّذِينَ وَتُ الْكِتَابِ Which means the women of the people of the book. So it's permissible for a Muslim to marry uh, a woman who's a Christian or a Jew. Ahl Kitab. Do sins disqualify someone from the 70,000? Basically, if it's uh, or if, if so, what types? Well, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rahim is all forgiving, most merciful. And he mentioned, the Prophet has mentioned these four qualities in particular that would disqualify the person from being among the 70,000. So you do the best, inshallah ta'ala, that whatever actually you do, uh, not that you don't seek ruqya from other people. Can you do ruqya for yourself? Yes, you can. You can. You yourself read the ruqya. And you can offer it to someone else without them requesting that. You can do it for your spouse, for your child, uh, for your friend, and so on. But you don't ask people by saying, can, I, can you do ruqya for me? That's one thing. It's not haram though. I want you to make it to understand it's not haram. If you really need it and you think it's beneficial to you and you're going to ask for it, then that's fine. But this qualifies the person from the 70,000. And superstition also, same thing. It disqualifies the person from that. Like, for example, thinking of number 13, or a black cat, you know, on Friday, all these kind of things and so forth. So there are some forms of superstition people they have actually these days here. How to make up for missed prayers? If you're attending my class, uh, Divine Link class, I will answer this inshallah this weekend, but the last, until tomorrow morning. <laughs> and if you're not attending the class, well, you lost a chance already. <laughs> But I would say, missing, making up for the missed salawat, 
um, if the person has missed, missed out, you know, missed active salawat for many years, then they should uh, work hard on their uh, on their nafila. We need to add a lot of sunnah. Don't just be satisfied with the five daily prayers. Add more before the salah, after the salah, unless it's a prohibited time. But if at all, mid p.m. or late during the day, inshallah, hopefully this will compensate for the loss of these years. But if it's just a salah that you missed right now, let's say you didn't pray maghrib and it's already a short time, simply just make wudu, pray salat of maghrib the way you do it if it was on time, and then you pray a afterwards, inshallah. From the sister's side, If we didn't make up the missed days of Ramadan, can we still fast the 10 days of the Hijjah? Uh, you're not going to be able to fast 10 days of the Hijjah because the 10th is the Eid day anyway, so now you cannot fast that day. But yes, you can. You can fast these days of the Hijjah, if you will. And as a matter of fact, these are not like Shawwal. Shawwal is exclusive season, so you have to fast Shawwal separately from making up for the days of Ramadan. But if you'd like to uh, uh, make your days of Ramadan during these nine days of the, of the or eight days of the Hijjah, then yes, except for Arafah. Arafah has to be for Arafah only. So eventually I would say, yes, you can make up to the intention for both at the same time, Allah. Does Dua change al Qadr, which means predestination from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The Prophet says in the hadith, which is Sahih, that uh, uh, if anything struggles, you know, uh, or basically yani would do anything for al qadr would be a dua and also Salat al rahim being beautiful to your kinship. And the meaning of this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by His divine and ultimate absolute knowledge knows that you're going to make dua one day. So the destiny was supposed to be for you will be actually changed based on that and it's already been written for you in your record that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will extend your age, Allah will give you provision and risk, Allah will make things better for you and so forth. Wallahu feel bad about being first <laughs> because there are others and you don't want them to feel bad uh, how do we deal with this issue of embarrassment of being first well if you really try to show off that you're first all the time then yeah you might embarrass other people but if you become first because alhamdulillah Allah blessed you with that be happy one time the Prophet was asked, Ya Rasulullah, Ar-Rajul Ya'mal Al-Amal, Yahmadu Alayhi nafs Sometimes we do the work, we don't have any intention to show off to people, we're just doing it for the sake of Allah, but then people, they know about it, they hear about it, they start talking about it. So what do we do on this case? Should we stop and quit doing good deeds because of this? He said, no. Tilka ajilu bushra al-mu'min, that is the quick and immediate good news given to the believer. So that's just like good news for you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted from you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you for it, and so on. So it is good to do that. Uh, but if you're going to be just be, becoming first and start looking at others and just start teasing them because you're first, then that's a big problem. There's a problem with your intentions here. If you're becoming first because Allah blessed you with that, you should be proud of it. The Prophet ﷺ, he one time was eating and then he was with a companion around with Quran and he says, Ana Sayyidu walada Adam wala fakhr. I am the Sayyid, the master of the children of Adam. Well, I'm not being proud of it, not being basic. This is not showing this, showing this, just this pride, basically. But it's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I'm proud of it. So if Allah blessed you with that, and you're not trying to make others, you know, feel bad because you're becoming first and so on, that is fine. Alhamdulillah, I mean, I'm from a personal experience. I, just like I was mentioned to you in the introduction, actually, I came, I came uh, uh, valedictorian in my batch in 1996 in of more than 500 students, actually. And wallahi, the first year, the first year when I was studying, I was doing my part because I loved studying the subject I was studying. Eventually, I was shocked, wallahi, I was shocked and surprised that the first year I came first. And that's all I could hear. So and now that I'm known to be the first student, everybody looking at you, mashallah, mashallah, and people start calling you shaykh and all this stuff and so on, it was really embarrassing. Truly embarrassing. I didn't know what to do. What I did in second year, I made a, a deliberate, a deliberate, I call it actually uh, sabotage for my uh, uh, reputation in terms of degrees. So what I did, I did not study for exams intentionally, so I went from the first all the way down to the 11th. 
And then uh, uh, some, of them, some of my mashayikh, they came to me, some of my teachers actually, they came to me. Well, I still remember uh, He told me that, what's going on? I feel that this is something wrong. This is not you who is basically doing that. So I explained the situation from how much this brought attention to me, I didn't really like and so forth and so on. So he gave me a very, very beautiful advice. He said, listen, if you're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah, it doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, if you're doing it for the sake of Allah, you might be a source of inspiration for others. So therefore, why, don't you, why do you miss this opportunity of being an inspiration for others? If you really keep it in your intention, it's done only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from there on, I, alhamdulillah, went back again doing my best until the last year. But alhamdulillah, I did it actually one more time and I got the valid term position. So I would say, don't feel embarrassed being, set, being first. But if you have that feeling of showing off, being proud over others, then you need to check your intention. What day of the Hijjah is Hajj? The Hajj of the Hajj, basically we're talking about the actual start of the activities of the Hajj. They begin from the 8th of the Hijjah. The 8th, the 9th, and then three more days after that. So you have 10, 11, 12, and that's when people start getting ready for the 13th. So these are the five days of the Hajj, inshallah. As for the Hijjah, the entire the Hijjah itself begins, inshallah, hopefully on perhaps maybe Monday. So you will have about eight days if you'd like to do fasting and so on. The 9th, which is Arafah day, also fasting day. The 10th is the Eid day. It's also a day of worship, uh, but you cannot fast during the Eid day. Okay. Can we take it, maybe just a couple of, uh, uh, yes, go ahead, why should we get back to this problem? We spoke about um, making decisions. Can you talk a little bit about um, the role of Ristakhar and at what stage we should do it? And is there like a small form we can do for making ah. small decisions? Jazakallah khair. The brother is asking about, you know, when you make a decision, you also need to, uh, you need to make istikhara. Istikhara, for those who don't know what istikhara is, it's when you pray two rak'ah, if you have a matter that you need to make a decision on, uh, the Prophet also recommends that you make wudu an evolution, act of evolution, and then you pray two rak'ah and make a specific dua that's known in books of, uh, uh, of uh, supplication and invocation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we make that invocation and supplication, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. So the istikhara means seeking guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in regard to a matter that you need to make decision on. So that's what does it mean. Where does it play in this whole issue? There are two things that you need to make in order to make a decision. One is called istishara and one is istikhara. The istishara, when you seek mashura, counsel, or basically advice. So you first, you, you ask people for advice, and then you make your istikhara from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you make your final decision on it. So someone, let's say a sister, she receives a, a proposal from a guy. And now she feels confused. She, she, she wants to know who this person is. So she asks people. And they give her good, some people they give, mashallah, uh, you know, positive feedback, other they give a little bit negative, negative feedback. She's feeling confused right now, she doesn't know what decision to make. After she made all her uh, uh, part in asking for advice, then she makes her istikhara and asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help her in making that decision. Istikhara overall is not binding, which means if you didn't have any feeling of inclination towards saying this way or that way, you can still make your decision. And even if the feeling is negative and you take the other side, you're still okay, inshallah, it's not binding and it's not haram to go against Allah. Sister, do you have any question? Yes? Alhamdulillah, congratulations. Thank you. I try, actually, I'm not really perfect at it yet. But my question is, sometimes I feel like question. Uh, okay. Sometimes I feel like questioning um, Allah, like, oh, why did you not do this? Why did you do this and that? So does that mean that my faith is not strong enough? Or when I question Him, like, Sometimes, because I love music, I used to listen to music a lot, but now I try not to listen to music because it's forbidden. So, but I still, I sometimes be like, okay, just one time, one time. No, so, but it does that mean that's I? That's for the good old days, right? I guess. <laughs> no. But does that mean I have 
with you're, you're faith doing, or no, I no, no, no. You're doing fine. The Prophet ﷺ said that this is something natural that we always will have these kind of questions in our minds. The Prophet ﷺ says sometimes you will have this question in your mind. You say, "Man khalaqa kada, man khalaqa kada." Who created this? Who created that? And you always say, Allah, Allah, Allah. Who created this? And then you come at one point and you say, Okay, then who created Allah? The Prophet says, If the shaitan takes you that route, just say, A'udhu Billah Min Shaitan. I seek refuge with Allah of the shaitan, and then quit these questions. What does that mean? That means because we are human beings. We are basically, you're, uh, uh, you're not infallible. And uh, uh, you're a finite being. You're just eventually going to die one day. So what is beyond matter? It's beyond our comprehension. So what is beyond this, what we, our life, is actually beyond our comprehension to a certain extent. So we always have to make sure that what, when we actually, when we start asking these questions, we know that it's out in our control. So when you wonder why Allah SWT did that or did this, instead of wonder, I would say questioning Allah, I would say wonder. So just, I wonder why this is happening. There's a difference between questioning and just wondering about things. So I wonder why this is happening to me, for example. You're basically seeking for the wisdom. But if you question Allah, now you're rejecting His divine plan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, said, wa nablukum bi wal We are going to try you and test you with both. That which is good and that which is bad. Sometimes good is not just because you are good. It's part of the test. It's because Allah wants to see, what are you going to do with this good thing I'm giving you right now? Are you going to be grateful or not? And sometimes when he tries you with something that is bad, it's not that he hates you or he's given up on you. But he's just testing you to see how patient you're going to be during this difficult time. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does all these things, there is always wisdom behind it. The Prophet says, المؤمن, How strange the affair of the believer. Everything he does is good for him. In If something good befalls him, he will be grateful and that will be good for him. And if something bad happens to him, and if something bad happens to him, he would be patient and that would be also good for him. So the believer always between being grateful and being patient. Questioning and wondering, that is normal. What we're going to do, we need to suppress these basically thoughts and educate ourselves about you know, the subject of trials, the subject of the meaning of life, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is for, why is these things perhaps happening by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Again, when you wonder about these issues, it's a legitimate thing and you will find the answer for it. But if you try to question it, as if you're questioning basically the, the meaning of God to begin with, Allah. It's going to take a while, inshallah. But I guarantee you, if you keep going with this path being between grateful and patient, you will succeed, inshallah. And I wish you the best. Thank you. Uh, can I ask one? Let's meet up the brother's side, please. Got any questions? Sisters, yes, go ahead. Um, um, my question was, um, I researched the Hajjah prayer a couple of times, but it never came to a consensus as to like how many requests I learned it in a different way. And like, I guess I learned it through like ancestry or whatever, like how my parents did it and my parents support, like their parents. So I was wondering, after doing research, I couldn't figure out how many rakats specifically it is because some people do say it's four, some people say eight, some people say eleven, some people say twenty. And I was wondering if you could clear that up for me and if there's certain surahs that you're supposed to recite when doing that prayer. Are you attending the Link class? Sorry. <laughs> you already missed that opportunity. <laughs> but we're going to talk about this in details on Sunday, inshallah ta'ala, afternoon. But just for your question, the Prophet وسلم, said, Salatul Layl Matna Matna. The night prayer should be performed in units of two. He did not set a limit for that in terms of number. However, his style of Qiyam al would be to pray these salawat and make them very long and beautiful. And he, was, he, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa about the best part of the night prayer, he says, Tul al the long recitation. The longer you recite, the better the salah is. Some people, what they do, they pray 100 rak'ah, Qul huwallahu ahad each. That's good. Alhamdulillah, I'm not rewarding for it. But if you would like to have the strong and real benefit of it, is that you need to recite very long actually recitation per rak'ah, which means you're going to listen the number of rak'ah. The Prophet lengthy salah would limit to eight rak'ah. So he would pray eight rak'ah according to Hadith Aisha radiallahu anhu. He never actually added more than that, except for the witr as well becomes eleven. So eventually that was the style of salah in terms of number and in terms of length. But if someone is not going to be able to perform that length of the recitation, then the Prophet says two units of two, as many as you wish. 
What is, what should I recite in, the, in, uh, in night prayers? Whatever you know of the Quran, if you know long surahs, is better. If you could not say long surahs, you can recite the short surahs many times per rakah right to make it long. So for example, if you only know three surahs of the Quran, you can recite them 20 times, 50 times, as many, don't even count. Just keep reciting them until you just feel that you have done enough. Then you make ruku. That would be enough for you, inshallah ta'ala. Is it permissible to hold the mushaf in Arabic, the Arabic one, while you recite the, the, the night prayers? I personally don't recommend that. Because eventually you're not going to feel it. You're going to be busy just trying to read the, the, the calligraphy of the Muslim, which makes, makes it difficult for you. So the best way of doing it is just recite what you know by heart and just try to feel what you're saying. Wallahu ta'ala. And I hope this answers your question, inshallah. Thank you. Uh, Sheikh, Can you make the Qada Salah in Jama'ah? The answer is tomorrow in the Divine Link, inshaAllah ta'ala. But yes, you can. Hadith Bilal radiallahu ta'ala, when they woke up and they did not pray Fajr, the Prophet sallallahu he ordered the Adhan to be called, they made wudu, they prayed the Sunnah, and they prayed Jama'ah together with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So it's alright to do that. Is whistling and clapping haram? Now, well, I read actually, uh, subhanAllah, it's very ironic because I was reading about this issue just uh, yesterday and even today in the morning when I was reading about the subject. The classical opinion, the classical opinion that probably have heard about it is that, you know, men should not be clapping because of the Prophet said, al nisa clapping should be for women. But if you don't look deep into this actually practice, the Prophet he mentioned that in Salah, in Salah, when you need to notify the Imam for a mistake that he has done, you should not be clapping. This is for men. Rather just say SubhanAllah. And women, they just clap so that they alert the Imam that he made a mistake. So that's in Salah. Outside the Salah, the ulama they argued about this issue. And there is actually a very proper opinion among the Fuqaha that it's, it's, not, it's not appropriate for men to do that. Uh, other ulama, they say it is actually uh, considered uh, a non-devotional act and therefore it's permissible. Uh, some they say makru, like Shaykh Rathamir rahimahullah ta'ala's opinion, my Shaykh actually. His opinion on the subject of clapping for men he said, لا أحب. I don't like it, but I cannot say it's haram. He said, the people they would like to encourage others and so forth. He said, I don't like that uh, uh, practice, but I just, he said, I cannot say that it's haram. So I would, I would follow that opinion that myself actually, I just said, said it depends, you know, to observe this uh, orthodox opinion. I would say it's, it's not haram, uh, but you know, it's, it's left for the person. It says personal choice, whether it's said it's makruh or just to you know, stay away from it. Regarding how to ask a woman in marriage, if you see a sister in public or an event and you want to express interest, how do you do it? It seems that the brothers are ready to start from this evening. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you guys are seriously ready for it, may Allah make it easy for you. But if you're not ready for it, Wallahi Afwan, take my advice. This is for both brothers and sisters. Guys, stop watching TV. What you see on TV, the, the boy and the girl, they bump into each other, hi, hi, oh, they fall in love together, they get married after all. It doesn't happen in real life. There's a specific etiquette that needs to be followed in this case. It's not haram for a man to directly propose to a girl. This is not haram. As Imam Bukhari, he actually he said a, a, a chapter on this subject, and he says even a woman is allowed to propose to a guy, directly. If she sees someone, she sees she, that he's much more qualified and good and so forth, and she expressed interest directly to him in a very, very respectful manner, then that's fine. But it depends on the culture. If the culture doesn't allow that, then start trying to avoid it. Otherwise, it might backlash on you and you never actually get opportunity to, to marry or him. So it depends on the culture here. So it's all right for a man to express interest. And my recommendation that if you're ready and you know that your family will support you and so on, then you need to find someone who's married who can have his wife maybe if on, you know, as a third party to see if she's interested first. So that you don't embarrass yourself if she says no in your face. <laughs> so therefore, if the third party tells you, well, lie, they're open. Which means they're open for negotiating for discussing the matter. In this case, Bismillah, go for it and propose. And inshallah, from there, she needs to bring her wali into the subject and have that action on a very high and official level. 
don't tell me, well, can we just be on campus to get to know each other and so on? I know you guys, you're already doing it, so why are you asking the question? Anyway? Is it the right thing? No. No, I have seen it. And I've given advice for many guys. I said, you guys are you're living your dreams. You just get yourself attached to someone in a hope that your parents will say okay to him or her. And then when they say to you, no, on my dead body, then you start basically crying and making your life miserable and their lives miserable. It becomes, basically becomes a drama. So do it the right way. If you're not yet ready for marriage, don't even approach that path. Stay away from these issues. Keep focus on your class and your school, inshallah. Love is not haram. If it falls on you, it falls on you. But the, what really matters here, what are you going to do about these feelings? If you have good feelings for someone, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to take the right course of action, the halal course of action, or are you going to waste your energy and your team because of that issue? So be careful with that. <coughs> for the brothers and sisters who become Muslims, and they join, alhamdulillah, Rabbi Amin, the camp of Islam and Muslims. First of all, I would like to say congratulations for the brothers and sisters. I was told to have alhamdulillah, sister who came and joined in Islam recently. So I would say congratulations. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for that. What I would like to tell you and give you the good news, that when you come to Islam, alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, you come with a surplus, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will erase all your sins. You come with a very fresh and blank page when it comes to sin. But for the good deed that you have done in your life, you will carry that with you into Islam, alhamdulillah. Another thing is that everything you do, you will have your reward twice. I have to struggle as much, twice as much as you do, because I was born in Islam. But you, coming to Islam, you actually you had your chances twice. And since you chose Islam as a path, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you twice marwatayn. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ajarun marwatayn. So you give your reward twice. So uh, enjoy, inshallah ta'ala, and your, uh, your company of the Muslims. I would like to advise you that uh, it's a time right now to take, to, to learn uh, slowly and gradually. Uh, don't get too excited about doing so many things at the same time, but just at the same time, don't be too slow. The more, inshallah, that you encourage yourself to become quickly, to go and, and become independent, it's better for you. Uh, it's better to have only one individual, inshallah, who can help you go through the beginning of uh, uh, your studies in Islam in terms of aqidah, theology, practice, and so on. And once you become, alhamdulillah, more uh, uh, strong in this area, you become more independent, and you can even, after that, open up, you know, for uh, other people. So eventually, do your best, inshallah, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for you, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you immensely in this dunya and the other. My sisters and I created a youth group for young Muslim girls. It takes place at a masjid. However, the Imam of our masjid does not support it. And it feels like it's a secretive youth group. Should we change the location? <laughs> no, change the password. If it's, uh, I feel really sad. I feel really sad that the masjid are not the, the places will welcome the gatherings of the brothers and the sisters when they come to, to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I, I wish I have control over the situation, but I suggest that you talk to your elders. I mean, I'm sure that you guys are parents, right? And your parents want you to come to the masjid to become better Muslims. So therefore, talk to your parents, to talk to the administration, to make some influence that this masjid is not, you know, is an on, it's not an ownership by anyone. It's for the whole community, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for you. And I would definitely support you that you guys get together and learn your deen, inshallah. Hopefully, perhaps maybe one day, you will have, inshallah, that the Imam engage in this group by giving you a special exclusive classes, inshallah, with the presence of some other elders in your community. Allah. Is it must to ask permission from parents in a case of marriage? Allah, if you want to start your marital relationship with a big mess, then don't ask for it. So eventually, if you would like to have a peaceful marital, because again, marriage, one more time, stop watching TV as your mom. <laughs> and the Cinderella style, you know, he fell in love with her, she fell in love with him, and they lived happily ever after, it doesn't happen that way. You are not just about you and her or, her or you and him. 
It's much more than that. It's a whole actually family constellation that involves my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, my cousins, my relatives. It's a whole different world when you get married. So therefore, don't say that, you know what, I don't want my parents' support. I can do it on my own. No, that's not right. Unless, unless you live a special unique lifestyle. For example, I don't have parents. Or maybe, alhamdulillah, I'm a convert, so eventually my parents, maybe they might not support me marrying a Muslim anyway. Or something like that. So eventually we have a very unique situation. This is a case-by-case -case scenario. You need to ask about it individually to give you the right answer, inshallah. People are still insisting on marriage issues. <laughs> Should have made it love notes again, part two, you know. Like, my friend asked, this is a, a, another question here. My friend asked me the other day whether animals go to Al Jannah. Does it matter? Anyway, maybe you have a pet, and that's why you want to make sure that it goes with you to Al Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet said on Judgment Day, Allah will resurrect all the animals. And they will come in that plane and, and, and first, and they will, Allah will judge between them first. So let's say if, an, if a lion prays that the, uh, a deer, a deer is going to go and attack that, uh, that lion. If uh, a dog went after a cat, a cat after a mouse, eventually they will take revenge and retaliate from each other. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, be, be, become a dust, become dust. So they all become dust. And that's when the kafir, as they look at them, they turn dust, he would say, Ya laytani kuntu turaba, I wish I can be a dust like this. Which means that all they wish that there have been animals in dunya and not to be judged to go to Jahannam as well. So from this hadith we learn that the animals will be judged and then Allah will take basically retaliation for them from each other and then they will turn into dust. Are there going to be any other animals in Al-Jannah? We know that there were birds and other animals, but are these the animals of the dunya? Allah Allah. Another question about mahar. You don't want to seem cheap, but then again, the sister has left the maha, which is the dowry, up to you. How do you determine the maha? <laughs> I would say the best way of doing that, it's basically a smart technique from the sister, by the way. Uh, but uh, if she left that for you, the way they determine the maha is by looking into her class. I mean by class, her family. So if she has sisters and they got married, how much they were paid for maha? Uh, her cousins, for instance, their relatives, how much they visit, determine mahar with and so forth. Also, your own family as well. So if you guys, if you pay mahar at the average $5,000, $6,000, don't be cheap and pay $500, $500. So this is what you're going to give them from the average. And if she, if she's in her family, she takes her up the average of five, six thousand dollars mahar. Don't go and try to show up and pay one hundred thousand, you know, and then start always taunting her with how much you paid for that. So be reasonable and determine that from the class that you have around. There are so many questions about marriage. I'm looking for actually looking questions relevant to the subject in the last five minutes we have. Again, married. I answered this question already. Answer this question. like too many practicing Muslims see the religion of Islam as a set of uh, mere practices. Let me put it this way, rituals. They consider this like, become like rituals. You have to pray regardless of the meaning of what you're making. Sometimes you fast Ramadan not knowing why, but because everybody's doing it over there. Uh, so they take it as rituals. 
Uh, Islam is practical and also fulfills the need of humans to become very spiritual. How can we balance out the spiritual and practical practicing aspects of Islam and not become robots? Now, like the subject of halal haram. SubhanAllah, I mean, uh, that is true. I mean, I do agree with you that living in this material life, it seems that people, there is so much into the dunya that uh, they just, they're interested in the minimum of the practice. Meaning, just make my five daily prayers, uh, fast the month of Ramadan, give my zakah, practice al Eid, and I'm done. And they do it in any cost, meaning it's the cheapest. If the least effort um, is required of me, I'll do it and they leave. Because of this, they lost the spirit of their ibadah and their worship. They walk in the streets, you don't see this samah, which means the spiritual aspect of their ibadah. It doesn't reflect in their actions. Why? Because it's not coming from the heart. It's coming just from my limbs, from my hands, from my mouth, and so forth. If you truly would like to practice Islam in all your life, then you have to think of it coming from inside out. It's not just about you doing your duty of five days present and I'm done. This is not the, the way it should be. It should be actually more deeper than that. So you make sure, inshallah, that when you make your ibadah, that you're looking beyond just the, the, the physical practice of the salah. This salah is a reminder for you that every day you are now in trial, and you are basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing you with that and it's a reconnection between Allah Azza wa Jal. Whenever you walk outside this room, remember Allah is watching over you because you just worshipped Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you always remind yourself and this becomes spiritual. And when you deal with people, you know that you're a Muslim, you display good character, you become actually spiritual. So it's not just by these rituals that we see in our masajid or homes.